Jesus, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. I thank you for the life that you've given us. And I thank you for the freedom you've given us. And I thank you for the victory you've given us. Lord, come and, and just speak to all of us through this incredible book of Revelation. Amen. Well, who knows that Revelation is a book of victory? Yes. Ian does, Colin does, I do. It's a victory book. Who thinks we need a bit of victory right now? Oh, goodness. You look around the world, we need victory. I tell you, the, the last book of the Bible is a book of victory. It tells you who wins. If it's ever in that, it tells you the end of the story. If there's ever a situation, it tells you this is what's going to happen at the end. It's good news. It's fabulous news. It's a fabulous book. Occasionally a little hard to understand. G.K. Chesterton once famously said that uh, some of the monsters that you read about in Revelation aren't nearly as monstrous as the people who try to describe the Revelation. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton, not me. But, you know, over the years, there's been some challenging and fascinating views on the book of Revelation. And, and I, and in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to tell you all about it and unpack it completely. <laughs> Pray for me. Uh, but in all seriousness, this is an incredible book. And often neglected and often sort of tucked away at the end. Oh, Revelation, don't have to do with that one, but it's kind of weird. You know? We'll jump to Revelation 22 when it's all good, but not sure about the middle bit. So uh, we're going to dive in, and today you can actually have some skills and some tools to help you. I'm not going to give you the full picture, can't possibly, but I'm going to equip you with some skills. So in the next half an hour, what do we got? 9.58. Half an hour. Switch on. We're going to go in deep, okay? We're going to give you some, some teaching, and I'm going to kind of land with how it, how it sort of works practically for today. But we've got to, we've got to go in a little bit. So let's, let's start right here with Revelation uh, 2, so Revelation 1, 9 to 20. Now, I am going to move over here so I can use this screen a little bit, um, and hopefully you can read that on the screen. Is that right, Ian? I'm going to get cozy over here. Right. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Right. Patmos. Here we go. Up here, Kristen, you're going to have to stay with me today. You're right. <laughs> Here's the Mediterranean Sea, North Africa, Israel, right around here, modern day Greece and Turkey. Patmos, who's been to the Greek islands? Oh, yeah, lovely. <laughs> so, Patmos is, you know, in that, in that region, okay? If you, if you know that part of the world here, that's the, kind of the Greek islands, looks lovely. So, so, so John. We think it's John. Most people really think it's John who was uh, the disciple of Jesus, who wrote John's gospel, wrote 1, 2, 3 in John. Uh, there is some debate, but most people think that he is the John who was on Patmos uh, on account of the Word of God. Now, basically, he was exiled. That's what they used to do to people, right? Go to prison, off to Australia with you, you know, or off to Patmos. You know? so, so he was on Patmos, uh, basically in exile. Uh, and he's writing back to some churches. It's, it's a letter. This book is a letter. It's, it's a letter written to some churches from John living on the Isle of Patmos. Makes sense? Okay. Whoops. Let's go here. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write! What you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So it's the Lord's Day, Sunday. He's in the Spirit. He's praying in the Spirit. He's probably worshipping. He's taking time out, probably early morning. I don't know. But, he, but he's, he's somehow caught up in the presence of God. On Sunday morning, early morning worship. That's how I see it. Good reason to be in the Spirit uh, on Sunday. 
And he hears a voice behind me, like a trumpet. Now, I've got kids who play the trumpet. This is not a quiet, subtle voice. Like, like this is a loud, trumpets are articulate. Right? They're, they're, they're clear, clarion, like it's a call. And he hears this voice and he says, write, write what you see in a book and send it to these churches. And so he turns to see the voice that was speaking to me. You know what? <laughs> Who's, who speaks like a trumpet? And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands were one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like wool white, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. Can you imagine this? You're in exile because of all the persecution that's going on around this area, Greece, Turkey, that is now. And you, I don't know how you're feeling, but you're in the spirit on the Lord's day. There's this voice behind you and you turn and you see Jesus, the risen, glorified Jesus. My goodness. That's what he sees. And, and there's a clear reference here to Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days. It looks, it looks like the description of God back, way back in the Old Testament. So, so he, he, knew, he knew who this was. This is, this is Jesus. And in his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when, him, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. It's, it's the normal response when someone sees God. Man, no, no answer. Bang. It's overwhelming. Boom. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place. There's a key here. After this, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let me unpack that a little bit. There's so much going on here. So, so he turns, he sees Jesus. Jesus is holding stars and lampstands. They are symbolic of the churches. And, and really what people think is that churches don't just exist here, right? Well, obviously, we come, we meet on Sunday morning and we come and do life group, we worship together, we preach, you know. But, but actually, beyond this church here is an angelic reality. There is a spiritual reality in heaven that represents this church. It's phenomenal. And this, like John is writing to just seven churches, so we can see seven lampstands. But, but you see, there's a, there's a spiritual reality to what's going on here. So when we're singing songs about the throne room, we, we are actually, really, literally joining in with angels in heaven. It's phenomenal. We, we're not just a little club meeting here, like a you know, sporting club or something. Like we're actually engaging in the supernatural power of the universe when we come. It's phenomenal. So John sees this. And, and you've got, got to understand that this was times of really heavy persecution. Times of just intense, I mean, people were being killed all over the place for their faith, sent to different islands. And, you, you know, so, so this is a letter of encouragement. It's a letter of hope. It's a letter of victory. And so what John sees is he sees, well, we might be battling down here as a church, but I tell you, there's a reality in heaven that's supporting us. So what, what he hears and sees is significant. And so when, when, the, when Jesus says, right there for the things, verse 19, that you have seen, those that are and those that are, to take, that are to take place, there's a key. Like, there are things that are, are present now in reality that I want you to write about. And there are things that are to take place that I want you to write about. And that actually gives us a real clue to most of the rest of the book. It's a setup. It's a setup. Now, 
and for the future. Okay, so before we get into everything and the detail of this all, it's important to understand some principles of revelation. In fact, if we understand some just typical Bible interpretation principles, it'll really help us unpack Revelation. This book has lots of different types of writing. Did you know that? Okay, it's, it doesn't read like a novel. You know, you get a, a novel like Lord of the Rings, you know, a big tome, a volume, and, and you open it at the beginning and you read it and the characters and story and complication, resolution. You know. it's, it doesn't read like that, even though there's a beginning and an end. There's history, right? There's, there's, there's historical narrative, we call it. There are letters. There's poetry. There's wisdom literature. There's um, apocalyptic literature, which means, you know, it's visionary kind of stuff. Um, there's just instructions. There's uh, uh, accounts, like biographies. You know, like the Gospels, really. Peter, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're just biographies of what Jesus uh, said and did. You know, so there's all kinds of different writings. Now, you and I know that we don't read history the same way we might read poetry. So if you pick up Shakespeare, there might be some historical realities or maybe embellished historical realities in Shakespeare. But you don't read it the same as you would a genuinely well-researched history book, right? And so, so understanding how to approach each different type of text in the Bible is actually really important when you come to a book like Revelation. And here are the four, hey, there's, there's heaps, right? but here's four really helpful interpretation principles. We've got the context, the fulfillment, the priority, and the applicability. Let me, allow me, just to dive in there really quickly before we uh, understand this a little bit more. Let's look at context. Understanding the context is important. So, if I was to read, for example, the verse in Matthew 5.30 that says, Cut off your hand if it causes you to sin. Has anyone done that? <laughs> Any one-handed Christians around there? Well, anyone sin? <laughs> You're not following the Bible, are you? Like, <laughs> what is that? It's called hyperbole. It's called exaggeration. It's a literary text type, right? No, no but I'm pretty sure. I mean, I haven't checked all of you lately, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that all of you have both hands, right? Now, I'm being a bit silly with this, but, it, but I want you to see something. You, you can't just read everything at face value in the Bible. Otherwise, nobody would have any hands. You know? And, and there, are, there are texts like this that you go, okay, I need a little bit of understanding. Jesus is, Jesus is exaggerating something. He's using a, you know, a type like, we say this all the time, you know, I'll, I'll go to the grave with that. But I don't really mean that. You know? We say all kinds of things. But we don't mean them literally. We, we're either having a bit of fun or we're trying to exaggerate something. Um, you know, so, so there are types in like that. So understanding what type of text actually changes the way you read it. And over history, people have grappled with this big time. Do you, do you just read the entire Bible at face value without really understanding the context? That's called a literal interpretation. So, so I could swing this dial over here. Uh, um, that, that's sort of, that will lead you to things called dispensationalism and just just a quick, ready understanding without any sort of context. Make sense? However, if, if you only think that everything has to have an explanation and a context, you, you and I will never get anywhere unless we're biblical scholars. Well, oh, don't understand that. I've got to look up the Greek and uh, work out what he and said, and then he said, and that person said, and I'll bring it all together, and then I'll apply it today. Well, that's frightfully dull, and if you think of the world over... Not many people have that sort of academic knowledge of the Scriptures. 
So there has to be a balance, right? And you also have to know which bits to read literally and which bits to read contextually. Revelation is both. There's bits of it. It's literal explanation, right? And there are bits that are not supposed to be read as instructions. And we'll get to those in a minute. So this this is one. That's the first uh, interpretation principle. The next one is around prophetic fulfillment. Big words. Bear with me. Did a prophecy, has, has it been fulfilled already? For example, Jesus in Luke 4, 21. He's in a synagogue. He opens the scroll of Isaiah 61 and he reads it out. Do you know this story? Phenomenal story. And he reads it out and he sits down. Do you know what he says? He says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Right? So Isaiah 61 is an Old Testament scripture. Jesus reads it and says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled. Does it mean that that, that scripture doesn't have applicability for today? No. It, it means that part, part of it's been fulfilled. Does it mean we don't ever read Isaiah 61 again? Knowing that, no, of course not. We, we understand it. But see, there are, there are prophecies that have been fulfilled in the Scriptures. Another one is, is Joel 2. On the day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit comes, people start speaking in tongues and prophesying and things. And, and Peter says, hey, this is, this is Joel 2. This is, this is what was said in Joel. I can see it. Like this prophecy has been fulfilled now. Got it? Does it mean we don't speak in tongues and prophesy? No, but, but a large chunk of what Joel was prophesying poof, happened there. You with me? Stay, stay plugged in. We'll get through this, okay? So Revelation, we've got to understand again, some of Revelation is fulfilled back then at the time of writing the book because it had an original context an original here. Some, obviously, of the book of Revelation has not been fulfilled yet, like Revelation 22, you know, like the end. It's not the end yet, hopefully. <laughs> or I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay, so we've got prophetic fulfillment. So when in the Bible or when in history has that been fulfilled? We've got to get a little bit of an understanding around that. I like this one. Progressive revelation, testament priority. All right, stay with me, stay with me. Do you interpret the Old Testament through the New or the New Testament through the Old? Right? Again, depending which way you look at this, depends on how you read certain Old Testament passages, particularly like the book of Daniel, as being fulfilled and interpreted by the New Testament. Actually, good theology says we, we go with the New Testament and we look back. Because the, the, the whole Bible has been written in a progressive revelation. So, so when Abram was wandering around, he had no idea, really. Like, no, no, no mosaic covenant. No, like, no, no real revelation. He just, but, but the further down we get in the Old Testament, the more we understand. And then they get to the New Testament, we see Jesus, and we see, ah, I, I get it. Now I understand the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament because of Jesus. That's why we're doing the New Testament first this year, and then we're going to dive into Genesis next month. We'll start the journey, right? So, so again, Jesus did this. He says in Matthew 5, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Where's that? Old Testament, he says, you've, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. It was written in the Old Testament. And then he says, now I say to you, don't resist one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other side also. Try that with your neighbor now. No, don't. don't. <laughs> so, so Jesus is saying, well, look, that was, yeah, that was then, but, but this is now. And if you understand who I am, it makes sense of the Old Testament. Okay, don't slap people. So, again, we understand the book of Revelation not by 
looking at every Old Testament passage about the end times by looking at the New Testament and working backwards. All right, one, last one, I promise. Applicability. Not, not, this is all the inspired Word of God. Agree? Every passage inspired by God. Not all equally applicable. Ooh. Not all equally applicable. So I read through Proverbs, I read through James, really practical books that say you, know, you should do this and do that, and do this and do that. I read through lots of Jesus' teaching. This is how you should live. This is what you should do. Right? A- applicability, meaning that what you read has relevance for the way you live. Lots of the, of the Bible talks about the nature of God. So Genesis, first chapters, you know, in the beginning and God created all this stuff. Is it like, what do I do with that? Do I go and try and breathe on things and create things? You know, do I go and create my own world? Is that, is that what it means? No, it's telling me about the nature of God. It's telling me about who God is. He's creator. He's the only God. He's sovereign. He's, he's powerful. Like, these are things that I read about in, in the start of Genesis. Not necessarily applicable, just, just things that I need to know. Make sense? Revelation is like that. Much of Revelation is not necessarily applicable, particularly once we get past uh, chapter 3. It tells us about who God is. It tells us about His nature, what He's like, and the plans and the purposes He has. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that we've got to go and do something about it. And so you put all these things together, and I may not spend much time on this, but just I'm going to throw it up there, and I'm happy to have a conversation if this is interesting for you. You put all these things together, and then you get, in general, four different frames of how you're going to read the book of Revelation according to how you've, which part of the dial you've turned on these books. All of them have validity. The book is so complex that theologians over the centuries have grappled with it. And, and different eras have different emphases. Different countries have different ideas. American theology is very different to, to British theology. And you know what? At the end of the day, it just doesn't matter. But to help you read it, to help you grasp it, and help you maybe have a conversation with someone who says, oh, what? you can have some idea of what it's about. Okay, So we have four main views of how to interpret Revelation. The first one is the preterist, mainly basically saying that it was written only to the, to the original hearers. It's all about that context. It's all about helping them through the battles of the first century. Um, that the Babylon, you know, was the Roman Empire and that it's all going to work out soon. It's in the context of AD 70 where Jerusalem was destroyed. I mean, it was horrible. Absolutely horrible. Uh, you read so many accounts of what happened in 70 years, just about 40 years after Christ died. Jerusalem was absolutely ransacked by the Romans. Uh, great loss of life and destruction. And, and actually, Jerusalem was never reformed until 1948, Israel as a state. So, so a massive tragedy. So the preterists would say, well, that's all about AD 70 and the, the trial and persecution then. Okay? The historist says that, look, it, it actually represents the entire sweep of human history. And you can, you can interpret things that are happening by certain events. But the problem is that over the years, you know, I mean, the, the, the evil one, you know, the, the beast, well, maybe that's, maybe that's Hitler, maybe that's, uh, you know, the Emperor Nero, maybe it's, they've kind of assigned, maybe it's Donald Trump, you know. Literally, people try and work out who the beast is. And it changes over time. Well, that wasn't the beast because there's another new one. And so they, they try to interpret the sweep of history through the historical view. Does that make sense? All right. You don't need to get all this. It's okay. The idealist, this is interesting, this one. It's basically saying that it's an, it's an allegory. It's, it's an, just an image. It doesn't really apply, but it, it just helps us to know good and evil, good and bad, um, and what's going on in heaven. 
So just they're just stories that you could apply at any point in time. Maybe. Uh, and the futurist says it's, it's actually all written about the future. It has zero applicability at the time of writing that the, the seven churches that we'll explore in a sec were actually seven churches in the future, the history, and try and map things out like that. Now, all of these have elements of truth. But, but to be helpful, I've distilled it down to something that I think is reasonably simple, pulling a few things together. All right, last, last little teaching bit. This is, this is my view, right? Just disclaimer. My, after distilling all of this, this is, this is what I think. Chapter 1 is introductory. Like, here was John. What was he doing on the Lord's Day? He saw a vision. Right? That's in the past. It happened. Scholars debate it probably around AD 90. Something like that. That's quite simple. Okay? Chapters 2 to 3... Quite simple, in my mind. It's, it's written to real churches in real places uh, with encouragements and exhortations. This is great about you. Ah, I'm not so sure about this. Can you change that, please? Right? Genuinely applicable to that era. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't, can't draw from that good stuff. But, but the actual original text is written to those people. All right? Four to seventeen, just a, just a quick chunk. I think it's re-establishing heavenly authority, and I think it's the then. So when this book was written, to the now. Now, I don't know about you, but I I get pretty grieved about what's going on in our world right now. Um, I. I have a particular heart and passion for a country called Myanmar, which is near Thailand, borders, actually borders India and a lot of different places. My goodness, um, they're in the middle of a civil war. Both sides are just abysmal. It's the forgotten war. It's, it's abysmal what's going on. They're basically getting to a point where they're saying Myanmar as a nation is defunct. It's not going to exist anymore. It's going to exist in probably five tribal regions that are self-governing, that are all trying to get each other. It's all driven by drug cartels. And it's, it's horrible. I, I, I grieve over a situation like that. I, I have connections on the border. Some of you know Pastor Yola, who we support. They, they, run, <laughs> they run food. They do whatever they can to, to help people crossing a little river that is the border between Myanmar and Thailand. And, they, and we support that. We take, they take food, they take staff, and they just try and help it. And I've seen pictures of people, absolute skeletons, carrying each other and fleeing. Their, their villages are being bombed and burnt. You know. Myanmar is not alone, is it? You think Sudan, you think you know, Israel, Gaza, you think Ukraine, Russia, you, you think... You think what's going on in Latin America, Venezuela, I'm not meaning to depress you, but I can't wait for the reestablishment of heavenly authority. Right? We, 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 there is an order and a rule. There will be justice. There will be judgment. God sees. God knows. He, he lets human free will run for a time. But there will be justice. And, and so a lot of what you read from 4 to 17, I think, is, is how God will reestablish who is the king, who is the boss, actually. He's handed it over to us. Now he's going to take it back. And so you see, as we'll get to it next week, Cole's preaching on this. <laughs> no, he's not. He's preaching on 4 to 5. But then is the glorious end. Huh, it's the most phenomenal thing about 18 to 22. That's in the future. It's things to come. So one of the best ways to, to read Revelation is to go, right, first is in the past. That was in the past. Still applicable, but historically in the past. 4 to 17 is ongoing. From the, when the book was written to now, it's an ongoing 
battle between good and evil, that is reflected here on earth. But one day, there's going to be a moment when God steps in and reestablishes the glorious end. Victory. Victory. That might be a helpful frame for you. And you, you might have read all kinds of things or you might not care, but this might just help you uh, frame and read particularly what you're about to read in our reading plan. Okay. I think it's time to get a little bit practical. And uh, I am more than happy to talk and ask questions uh, to you any time about this. I don't pretend to be an expert. Let's dive into Revelation 2 and let's look at what's going on here. Remember, there are, there are seven churches. We're just going to focus in on Revelation 2 and 3. There are seven churches that Jesus talks to John and says, hey, John, write these things down and send them to these churches. Let's just look at one of them. And one that I think is actually pretty applicable for today. Revelation 2 verse 1 says this, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. It's problematic, right? People go, well, is there an angel on each church? Or is it talking to the leader of each church? No one really knows. So I'm not going to conjecture. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Remember, these are the images of the church in heaven. He says, I know your works, verse 2, your toil and your patient endurance. This is the, this is the church of Ephesus. He says, I know, I've seen it. I know your works. I know your toil and I know your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. He says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Wouldn't you love God to say that about you or about this church? He says, I know, I know you've been, you've been battling, you've been faithful. I know your works. I know you've been enduring patiently which means you've been going through trials. You can't endure patiently without some testing, right? I know what you've been going through. You've been patient and faithful, and you have not grown weary. I love God to say that about me. But I have this against you. That's nice, Jesus. Um, actually, let's just leave it there. <laughs> oh, don't we love feedback? Who loves feedback? You know, who in their workplace, you know, the boss says, oh, is there some feedback? Can you give me some feedback? Who goes, yes, oh, I love feedback so I can do my job better. Uh, most of us don't. I hate it. But it's good for our humility. So Jesus gives some feedback. It's that simple. He says, but I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this I have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans. It was a bit of a, a cult, a sect that taught sexual liberty. Let's face it, that's what it was, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He says, you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember when you got saved, everything was amazing and, and you sold property and you gave things away and you, and you testified about my name and you loved me and you loved other people. Now, despite your patient endurance, you're kind of, you're missing the love thing. Remember 1 Corinthians 13, you know, maybe you're just a noisy gong. You, if you have not love, you're just, you're just a bit noisy, maybe. But then he says, it gives them a, a way out. He doesn't just say, hey, this is what I have against you. He says, no, well, actually, this is how to change. Good management strategy, right? Good people skills. Unless you repent. Here's your way out. Repent. Turn around. Repent just means to, to stop doing that and start doing something else. Like a U-turn. It's, it's really, really easy. He says, he who has an ear, 
verse 7. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the one who conquers, I'll grant to eat of the tree of life. Like if you can conquer this, if you can overcome it, man, you've got victory coming. I like this. And the whole deal with the stars, you know, he says, I'll remove your lampstand from its place if you don't repent. This, this verse really scares me, actually. I mean, as, as a church, like, I mean, are, are there churches out there who've lost their lampstand? Like, like, who just keep barreling along without hearing Jesus and just keep going down their own direction. It's fine, Jesus, we're, we're toiling away here. It's okay, we've, we've got it, don't talk to me. <laughs> you know? But, uh, you know, you end up just nowhere and with no love and Jesus is gone. Psh, he's taken his lampstand and started something else. I wonder if that happens. That's what scares me. That's what keeps me humble. So that's a church. And I think there's lots to ponder here for our church, for churches. But if, you, if we just widen the view a little bit and we look at the other six churches, here's, here's some of the con- commendations. Hard work and perseverance. I'm just summarizing chapter 2 and 3. Intolerance of wicked people. Enduring afflictions and poverty faithfully. Not fearing slander or persecution. Holding fast to Jesus' name and not denying the faith. Love, faith, service, patient endurance. Having greater works than at first. Remaining pure, patient endurance. Like These are the things to the churches that Jesus says, hey, I love it about you. I love it. Thank you. And he says uh, to the other churches as well, most of them, some uh, what we call exhortations. Some have abandoned their first love for Christ, like the Ephesians. They're tolerating other teachings that sort of creep into the church that maybe don't match biblically. They tolerate false prophets leading into sexual immorality, being spiritually dead. When you love God to say, well, oh, you're dead, wake up. Having incomplete works and needing a wake up. Lukewarm faith that was Laodicea. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either, or I'd spit you out of my mouth otherwise. Be zealous and repent. You get a sense that Jesus wants his church to be alive, full of passion, full of conviction, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the victory mindset they need, despite, despite incredible opposition. And to be honest, the church in Western world is pretty weak because we don't have an obvious opposition. And so we just cruise along. But I tell you, there are churches around the globe who fire up because of the intense persecution that's against them. Just to finish. Just to finish. And I might get the musos to come up here if that's all right. I want to talk about Revelation 3. Finish off this. Right, right at the end. Revelation 3, 19. I'll pull it up on the screen. It says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Those whom I love, I approve. It's something you need to know, church. God loves you dearly. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. And the one who conquers, I'll grant him to sit with me on my throne. As also I conquered and sat down on my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Can you see what this is? This is an exhortation. This is is an encouragement to us. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. What father doesn't step in every now and then and say, hey, lift your game. Hey, you've noticed this? Maybe you could do it this way. Good fathers don't just let things run in their kids. Good fathers kindly, lovingly, but surely step in and go, hey, I love you too much to let this happen. 
What about that? So, so God is saying to us, He's saying, hey, I love you. Therefore, don't, don't be, don't cower away at things that I might say to you. Actually, He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm knocking all the time. I'm, I've, got, I've got insight for you. I've got wisdom for you. I've got words for you. I'm, I'm here. This is not just a salvation message. This is a message for everybody. I'm knocking. Right now, the Holy Spirit is knocking. Saying, I love you dearly. I love you dearly. And there's some things that I want to show you. There's some things. He says, if you hear my voice and open the door, I'm going to come in. I'm going to eat with you. I'm going to fellowship with you. If you let God in just a little bit, He is going to come and eat with you. It means He's going to do life with you. And He says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Huh. Just, did you read that? It says, as if, you, if you let Him in and, and change what you're doing and listen to Him, He says, there's a throne you're going to come and you're going to sit on my throne in victory. And he's about to unleash what this is through the rest of the book of Revelation. But we see this glorious throne, this amazing powerhouse of the universe. He says, you and I have a place there. You and I are not like the angels. We're not just servants. Actually, we are co-heirs with Christ. I want you to see this. If, if you let Jesus into your heart and continually let Him in, let Him speak to you and change things, He says, there's a, there's a place for you in rulership of the universe. This is the destiny of every single person on the planet, if they want it. This is the path. This is the whole point of creation. <laughs> this is why you were created. You were created to rule and reign with Christ. That's your destiny. Look up, see your future, see the possibilities, see where you're headed. Seated, seated, it says. On His throne. Come on. Why are we living such little lives? Why are we bothered by such little things when our future is glorious and bright? Why is it, why are we looking downcast and why, why do we think? Why do we get beaten around so much? I feel like that sometimes. Close your eyes for a moment. Can you see this throne? We're about to, you know, you've, read, you've probably read it. Probably read the end. The glorious throne is surrounded by angels upon angels, armies and armies. It's powerful. It's majestic. It's, and and, and the, the creator of the universe is inviting you into that space. He says, if you conquer, if you overcome what's in front of you, he says, keep going. Keep at it. You can do it. Hear the, the witnesses who have gone before you. Hear the, the people who've faced even death. You, you can overcome. You can love your neighbor. Come on. You can love your husband or your wife. You can care for your kids. You can do that job at work. You, you, you can pull your head in and stop, you know, being so proud. You, wh whatever it is that God is knocking on the door and telling you, He says, you, you do that and conquer in this life and you will conquer with me in eternity, seated on the throne of God. That's a vast picture of your future. Stay humble. Stay repentant. Stay in the, in the zone, in the journey. And I tell you, your future is bright. Don't check out on Him now. Too much blood has been shed. Too many things have been lost. It's an exhortation to keep at it. Keep being faithful. Keep going. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? I'm going to take a moment. Just take a moment. He's knocking. He says, I want to speak to you in love. I want, I want, to, I want you to see something. Just allow Him to speak to you. What is it?
if you're hearing something that feels like it's a bit hurtful or a bit corrective, you might have pictures of people or situations, your own attitudes. You might hear him just say, hey, can you do this for me? Instruction is to hear this in the context of love. Just be zealous and repent. Let's change quickly. Today, make that phone call. Forgive that person. Change your attitude. Fix something up. And, and just do that every day. Every day, come before him and say, Lord, what do you say to your church? What do you say to me? I know you're knocking. I know you've got things to talk about. How, how can I yield a little bit more today? How can I surrender a little bit more? You'll find life and victory replace confusion and doubt. Holy Spirit. And maybe you're here this morning and you hear that knock, but you've actually never let Jesus in to start with. But today is the day of salvation for you. Today is the day where you can enter into this relationship and this astonishing future. If that's you, I'd like you just to raise your hand. If you want to know Jesus and you've never actually come to Him before. Or if you've been away from Him and you, today you just, oh, I need to come back. And you need to, you're hearing the voice of Jesus saying, come back to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. I've got a very good future for you. I've got a, a victory in heaven for you. Is that you to come back today to Christ? And, and, the, and the walk, just slip your hand up. I'll see it. And I'll touch base with you after the service. There's one last verse on the screen for you. Revelation 4, 1. After this, after these letters to the churches in 2 and 3, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. You ready for the next bit? The after this? You ready for the next part of our journey in Revelation? Well, that's next week.